So hello, everyone, and thank you for being out here on such a beautiful um, afternoon here in Ithaca. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. As Kim said, I was on the faculty here for five years, and it, it was so impactful to my career, and I had such a wonderful time um, here at Cornell. So it's just a real honor to be here with you again today, and also to um, be giving a named lecture for two women who have been who were so important on this campus in terms of advancing gender equality, and who were so deeply concerned about gender equality and social justice justice issues more broadly. Um, I really like to think that um, I have this same kind of dedication to, in my work, to both trying to understand the barriers to gender equality, but also, as Kim said, I'm working on solutions to get beyond those barriers. And I'm going to share a piece of that work with you today. Um, so this is the, the talk I'll be giving, it was, uh, my co-authors and I, um, a paper we've written. And what this is going to be is a two-year uh, case, so result from a two-year case study inside a Silicon Valley technology firm, where we went into this company to assess their performance assessment process and to ask whether and how gender might be influencing how people in this company were evaluated. Okay, so that's what I want to share with you today. And um, I'll just want to first just tell you a little bit about the case. Um, this is a company that I'm going to call uh, by the pseudonym Large Tech. Obviously, that's not a company's real name. Um, it, if it turns out if you're going to go into a company and study how, biases, how gender biases might be influencing their processes, you're not going to get to name them by name. They only agree to this if you disclose their identity. So I'll just tell you a little bit about them. Um, this is an internet company in the Silicon Valley. It's large, as you can see, over 20,000 employees. Um, technical professionals make up the majority of their workforce. Um, the CEO there at the time was strong supporter of gender diversity initiatives. They had a very um, active women's group there. And yet, with all that work, as you can see by the bottom bullet point, um, only 25% of their technical professionals were women. And it, those numbers got lower as you went up to a, the higher level of director and above. So how did I get to study uh, this company? Well, the CEO, very concerned about these numbers, um, called me and asked if I would come in and do unconscious bias training for them. Okay, and I'm going to talk about unconscious bias training here in a bit, but basically wanting me to come in and teach their, uh, teach their uh, managers and people in their workforce about the way that stereotypes about gender and other groups might be um, uh, causing bias to uh, enter into their processes. And, you know, this kind of training has become extremely popular, um, as this quote here from the Atlantic Magazine says, you know, uh, spreading throughout technology all over the Silicon Valley, across the world, um, extremely form a common form of uh, training. I was getting calls all the time to come in and do this training. Actually, the first time I ever did unconscious bias training was here at Cornell, um, so this, like, you know, never goes away. Um, so anyway, they, they asked me to come and do this training, and, I, and every single time a company would call, I would say, look, I'll come in and do this training, but what I want from you is I want to bring my research team in and we want to study one of your people processes. We want to study how you do hiring or how you do performance assessment. And sometimes a taker it would say, yeah, come on out, we're really eager. And I would get there, we'd have a great discussion. Then lawyers would come in the room and I would get kicked out. Okay, this went on over and over again. This company, okay, when they called me in, um, and I came in and talked with them, had a really productive um, conversation, and they said, now we need to check with our lawyers. I thought, okay, I'm out of this game. Um, but then they called back the next day and said, okay, let's go, okay? So I want to share what we've, done, what we've done with this company. And I'm going to do it in this way. Um, to set it up first, I'm, just a, I'm going to do a very little um, kind of uh, background lit review, just enough to kind of level set here um, with, with all of us. I'm going to first review um, the, very briefly the literature from social psychology on how stereotypes can bias the evaluations of people. This is a very large literature. I'm going to give it a very short shrift, but just enough to get us going. And then I want to review uh, very briefly some uh, literature from um, organizational sociology that looks at whether formal procedures for like, hiring people and assessing their performance, if these formal procedures um, do a good job of getting rid of bias. Then we'll turn to the heart of the matter here. I'm going to go into this case study with you. And what we're going to look at here is whether gender stereotypes seem to be reflected in the written narratives managers write when they evaluate their employees. Okay, so that's going to kind of lay out the problem. And then I want to take you to um, the last bullet point, which we're, uh, this is some work in progress here, um, looking at how inter organizations can intervene and block the effects of bias. So that's kind of the four steps that we're going to go through here today. So how do stereotypes affect the evaluations of individuals? Anyone in here who does this work, I'm sorry. I'm going to go through this very, very quickly um, to make a one, a one point um, and then kind of move on. And the central idea that I want to share from this, uh, this research is this. What we know is that stereotypes function as what we might think of as a cognitive shortcut in information processing. 
And they do so especially when decision makers are in a decision making context where um, the how to make a decision is left unspecified, it's really ambiguous, and when people are in a hurry. Okay, so those conditions really um, exacerbate bias. And you know, I was recently um, in one of these situations myself. Um, this last uh, fall, I mean, last spring, I chaired graduate admissions at Stanford. So um, you know, we, we have people apply to the graduate program, we evaluate their applications, and we pick a few people to admit to our program. And we had 170 people apply, and we had 10 slots. Okay, and any of you who are graduate students or any faculty who have done this, you know every one of these applications is, you know, this like thick thing with letters of recommendation, papers and all that, had 170 of them and we had to make decisions very quickly or else we would lose our best students to people like Cornell, so we got to move quickly here, okay, with all this performance information, um, you know, and, and no real criteria about how to make the decision, okay. In that situation, everybody on that committee is taking some sort of a shortcut, okay, they're not reading every last word. But what research shows, unfortunately, is that stereotypes about gender, race, and other categories function as, those, as, as shortcuts. And when they do, they lead to disadvantages from lower status groups, women, people of color, and the like. I'm going to show you one study that, sh kind of, that, that illustrates this. Um, and it's a study from the field of psychology where what the authors of the study did is they sent out a VITA for a person who had just finished her PhD in psychology, okay, an actual VITA. Um, and but before they sent it out, what they did is they took the real name off the Vita and they put a woman's name on, um, on some of them and a man's name on the others. And then they sent it out to, randomly sent it out to psychology faculty all over the country. Okay, so same Vita, same pu publications, same grant grants, everything's the same except for this name. Okay, so the question is, does this name matter? And it did. Um, so what they found is that 72% of people who got the Vita with a man's name on it said he would be worthy of hire in their department, compared to only 44% um, who got the Vita with a woman's name on it. Same exact Vita. And it did not matter whether men or women were the raiders, okay, same amount of bias, which is a common finding in this literature. Now, um, a couple of things I want to say about this study. Um, one, there's a, there are literally hundreds of studies that are similar to this. The magnitude of the effect varies. It's not always this large, okay? Sometimes, there, sometimes there's no difference. There's occasionally the instance where women are advantaged over men, okay? Context matters here, and that's going to be good news for us, okay? Because we, that's what we're going to be wanting to do is change context. Now, if you look at the date, the study was from 1999. It's an old study. I could have put up a more recent study, and in fact, there was a study very similar to this one done in 2012 that found the exact same thing, okay? So, but I put this one up because it has an interesting point that I want to make. This Vita, when it went out to people, was a Vita for an assistant professor, someone who just finished her PhD. A second part of this study, what they did is the exact same experiment, except now it was a Vita for a person four years later when she'd gone up for early tenure, so the same person four years later. So what's changed in four years? She has, and she got early tenure, so she probably had a pretty good Vita. Um, she has more publications, she has more grants, all these sorts of things, okay? And they, sent, they do the exact same experiment, and when they do that, we get no significant difference here, okay? So what's the difference? This is a situation that's more ambiguous. We have a lot less performance information on an assistant professor than we would have for someone who was more senior in their career. So those numeric differences are gone, but four times, we still found this difference, four times more doubt-raising statements were, were written on the rating forms for the candidate who was described as a woman, okay? I would need to see evidence she'd gotten those grants and publications on her own. So notice that extra scrutiny that's going on, okay? Or it would be impossible to make such a judgment without teaching evaluations. Nothing wrong with the criteria of teaching evaluations when you're hiring a faculty member, but notice it's a new criteria that's being raised when evaluating women. So if you think about this, this person is just as likely to get hired, but she comes into a job with these kind of doubts about her hanging over her. So these are the kind of things that we find a lot in experimental studies like this that establish um, that bias. What we're going to be doing with a case study is asking how we would see that in an actual organization. Okay, uh, one more bit of lit review to get going. Um, what I want to know, ask is whether formal procedures could help us get beyond these effects. And there's reasons to think the answer to that question is yes, because if, if stereotypes are biasing our judgments because we lack, it, it's, our decision-making context is ambiguous, formalizing these processes, okay, laying down specific rules and things like that should help, okay? The literature in organizational sociology frames this question about whether formal procedures are a great leveler, okay, that is getting rid of biases that would otherwise be there, 
or whether they're instead a smokescreen, looking meritocratic, but actually letting bias still creep in the door. So what do we know about this? Well, on the great leveler side, we know that in general, formal procedures are associated with better diversity outcomes, like more women in management. So you have a formal procedure, generally your diversity and, um, outcomes look better. There's a correlation there. But research also finds that even with formal procedures in place, we still find biases. And this is thought to be because the way that managers use these formal procedures is decoupled from the, 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 their intended goal when they were created by um, HR executives, for example. Okay, so managers seem to really be the key. If you clamp down on their discretion, you see less bias. You give them more discretion, you see more bias. But the question is how, okay? Managers are kind of the linchpin in this literature, but how? What are they doing? And I, the way I've been thinking about this problem is really illustrated nicely uh, by a quote from Dobbin and Caleb. They wrote in a paper, we can't look inside the heads of managers for the precise mechanism that leads to the different numbers okay, of women and minorities. Okay? We can't see inside their heads, so we don't know really what's going on. Um, we just know that, that managers are doing something. So this is where we entered this project uh, and I'd argue that by, what we're going to do here is analyze a sample of managers' written performance reviews. Okay, this is what they've written about their employees and we're going to argue that this presents a glimpse into managers' thought processes and logic. Okay, so that's kind of what we're going to be doing here uh, as we go forward. Okay, so with that in mind, I now want to talk a little, return to, uh, return to large tech and talk a little bit about what we did here to ask, to ask the question of whether gender was influencing uh, managers' written performance reviews. And to do this, I want to tell you a little bit about the performance management process. Um, and this is uh, not unique to this company. This is very, uh, very typical, actually. Um, every six months uh, in this company, managers um, write, a, uh, write a, a review of their employees, okay, so a narrative describing their strengths, weaknesses, and things like that. They attach a numeric rating to that review on a scale of one to five, with five being uh, the most positive. And then all of the, then all of the, uh, all of the reviews for managers in a given a unit, um, managers go into what's called a calibration meeting, okay? Where the goal here is to smooth out the differences between um, what we might think of as easy and hard graders. A lot of us, if we have multiple TAs, do this with our TAs as well, okay? Calibrate other reviews. And then these calibrated ratings um, directly affect organizational rewards, okay? They affect, um, the kind of bonuses people get. If you're gonna get promoted, you pretty much have to have a five, um, raises and things like that, okay? So what I'm gonna be analyzing or talking to you about today are these first two uh, bubbles here, the manager's, manager's reviews and numeric <coughs> ratings. Another project, we have data on calibration meetings, and at the very end, I'm gonna show you just a little bit of that. Okay. okay, so why performance management? Of all the places where people are evaluated in an organization, why did we pick this? Well, when we started studying this company, we gave a survey out to managers and directors that were at a retreat we were attending, and we asked them a couple of questions. The criteria for promotion are objective, okay? Calibration meetings follow a thorough and deliberate process. And as you can see here, very low percentages of people, and these are managers and directors, people who are very familiar with this process, very few of them thought that these processes were uh, clear. And why that's important is ambiguity opens the door to bias. So these numbers suggest this is a place where bias has a lot of opportunity to um, enter into the decision making. Now, um, I have uh, the percentages that of women and men who agreed with these statements. And when I first showed this data to the company, they were fixated on these gender differences. And my response back to them, is, I, you know, I'm, I'm a gender scholar, I'm usually interested in gender differences, but I kind of think the point here is that almost no one, you know, like <laughs> thinks these things are, you know, cl clear and objective. So um, we decided we would focus here, and so we started doing some focus groups uh, with different groups of employees, and what we found is um, some, um, some indication that gender might be influencing this process. So uh, we did focus groups with um, a group of women who had been promoted reasonably uh, recently, and what we heard from these focus groups is that early on in their careers, when women first came to this company, they were told they were too nice and not strategic enough. So that was the advice they were given. So if you're given that advice, you probably start to act you know, more strategic, right? That's what they're telling you to do. But what they found is that once these women moved into leadership roles, they were criticized for not being approachable enough. So you see you can't win. You're either not strategic, or if you act strategic, you're not approachable. And this is a common finding in social psychology, that competence and likability tend to be negatively correlated for women, but not men. So we found this in our focus groups for women, but not men. And as only the onion can summarize social science research, a woman leaves meeting worried she came across as too competent. 
So with this, in, with this in mind, we decided to do a systematic study of these performance reviews. And so what I'm going to share with you today is a sample of performance reviews. Uh, it's a random sample, 208 performance reviews. Um, and we have the data. The data includes the full text of manager reviews and their numeric rating. Um, we we hand-coded these reviews with three different coders, so this was a really labor-intensive process. Um, and we did this because, I mean, I, I live in the Silicon Valley, I, I understand a thing called natural language processing exists, but what it turns out is that this is an area where we don't have, for some of the areas we have some good codes, for others we don't, and in areas where theoretical concepts are not well developed, it's generally advisable to start with hand-coding, so that's what you're going to see. Um, not, we have 93 different codes. Don't worry, I'm not going to show them all to you. Um, one limitation of these data is we have, we have gender of the employee. We don't have race. They would not give us race. They would give us gender. That was their lawyer's decision. It makes no sense if you understand civil rights laws. But nonetheless, we got the data with gender but not race. Um, and we took the gender, the names off of the reviews, pronouns off the reviews um, before the coding was done. So the coders were coding blind to gender. Okay, I want to do three things with these data. And the first is the least novel, but I, I want to give you a flavor for the data. And that is, I want to just ask if there are gender differences in the codes, okay? Are managers, you know, using different kinds of language to describe men and women when they're rating them? And we find in some places, yes, okay? So um, more, uh, more of the what we call standout language appeared on men's reviews. So being called a genius, a game changer, or a visionary, as you can see from the blue bars at the top, about 60% of those codes were, went on uh, men's reviews and not, and not women's. Um, and I'll, I'll say this difference here is not statistically significant. Um, one of the reasons why is these aren't, very, these aren't commonly used codes. I mean, if you go around calling everyone a genius, it loses all meaning pretty quickly, right? So it's not significant. But, and, and I will say across a lot of the codes, we don't find a significant gender difference. Um, this is not a complete smokescreen. Um, it's clear the managers are doing their job. But we do find some significant gender differences, and they were exactly on the codes where we predicted we would see them. So, for example, gender differences in the attention to communication style. So, 60% of all negative communication style went on women's reviews. And in particular, women were substantially more likely to be given feedback that they were too aggressive, whereas men were given feedback that they were being too modest. Now, what we can't know from these data is whether this is the result of some sort of bias, like men and women are enacting a behavior and people are more worried about it when it comes from women, or whether this, is the, whether this reflects the actual behavior in the organization and managers are simply dutifully recording it. Having spent two years in this company, I will assure you this is not a company full of really aggressive women and really modest men. And I've been a lot of technology companies, I've never seen that, okay? So this seems to be more consistent with what we know from social psychology about how people police what they consider to be um, gender inappropriate behavior. Um, we also coded the extent to which um, they, the, uh, the reviewers used communal versus agentic language, which is a common, uh, a, a common way of, of understanding uh, gender stereotypes. Communal language, supportive, team player, things like this. This overlaps with our stereotypes about women. Agentic language, confident, strategic, entrepreneurial, driver, influential. This agentic language overlaps with our stereotypes about men. It also overlaps with our stereotypes about leaders, and it overlaps with our stereotypes about tech workers, okay? So the question is, do we see differences here? And we do see significantly more of the communal language on women's reviews. So here's an example. I appreciate how she's helping run the organization with me. Notice she's helping, that sounds really communal, but notice how it also serves to diminish her perceived leadership ability. She's helping with me, okay? She's it's hardly much of a leadership statement. Okay, agentic, no significant difference here. There was more of it on men's reviews, but not significant. And this, I think, is a good thing because this is really the bread and butter of technology. So if we were seeing huge differences here, this would be a problem. Um, here's a man who got a five out of a five top rating. If you didn't know what the word agentic means, this is like a great illustration of it. A great leader to drive innovation, can make things happen when he likes something. He has the magnetic enthusiasm to cite the team. He's aggressive and moving forward. Notice he's called aggressive. When we find aggressive on men's reviews, notice it's in a positive context. And then finally, on the just uh, straight-up gender differences, we found uh, that women were less likely, that women, that men were significantly more likely to get uh, uh, developmental feedback, and women got more vague feedback, okay? So, for example, this woman gets a three out of five. The team's success can only come about with her successfully stepping up and realizing her potential. If this is on your review, what do you do with that? You know, who knows? Um, cry, I guess. Um, <laughs> 
this, whereas here, if, assuming you know what, the, what this person's talking about, this seems to me like very specific feedback. X should help the regression team develop a logger to identify issues sooner, okay? That you can act on, okay? So we found this differences as well. Now, um, a lot of people have studied language use and evaluation, so this is a little bit less novel. The, the other two pieces of analysis I want to share with you, I think, are more new. And that is, I want to now ask whether the relationship between language and ratings differ for men and women, okay? So does being seen as agentic, for example, um, is it associated with higher ratings for men or women, okay? So we want to see what the, how the language is affecting ratings. And so uh, to do this, what I did is created three um, theme variables where we summed up the codes of, um, of the language words that were highly correlated with each other. So I'm going to be talking about three themes, helpful, taking charge, and vague feedback, okay? And so here's what I want to do. I want to, I want to assess the relationship between these themes and the ratings that an employee got. Okay, so over there you see the distribution of the ratings in our sample, and as you can see, there are no ones in the sample. There are almost no ones in the entire company. Ones are the lowest rating. If you're getting a one, you're probably, you probably wouldn't be staying around long enough to be in the company when performance review time happened. Ditto twos, okay? Um, twos are not eligible for any bonus at all. Um, and then at the other end, fives, this company, as lots of companies do, great on a curve. People who get fives expect to be promoted. There's not room for everybody to be promoted, but they expect to be. They get the biggest bonuses, okay, the biggest raises. So there's budgetary implications. So there's a pressure to not put too many people in the five bucket. Okay, so this is what we have here. And what I want to ask is how these themes are associated with those ratings, okay? Now, I have a double-headed arrow there, okay? Um, it's, you know, when people, when people are writing a review, right, they're writing a narrative and they're putting a rating on the person's review. It's not clear whether they're at any time just thinking about the person, you know, writing down everything and then putting a number on the review or putting a number on and then using the language to justify that. But either way, if there's a different pattern there, that would be suggestive that gender was influencing the process. So let's start with helpful. Um, my first thought is helpful, more helpful language should lead to a higher rating because being helpful is a good thing. And that wasn't right. Um, instead, what we see is the more helpful language you have, the higher your rating up to the four, but then there's a drop off, okay? This is the, this is the uh, figure for men, that's for women, so they, the, the, the curves look pretty similar there, okay? But the, the, you know, what's happening here is that sort of helpful language, um, is, it only takes you so far in terms of, um, of having a higher rating, okay? So um, that's helpful. Let's look at taking charge now. This is that agentic driving change. This is the bread and butter of technology. I would expect to see this going straight up towards the five, okay? And that's true for men but not for women, okay? So the more helpful, I mean, the more agentic language men have, higher the rating for women, again, a drop off there, okay? Vague feedback, not usually a good thing. That's what I wanna go to next. And what we see is vague feedback is negatively associated with performance ratings, okay, for men and women, but it's a steeper slope for women. And especially notice how women who are getting the lower ratings are getting more vague feedback. If you're getting a low rating, it would be helpful to have developmental feedback, not vague feedback. So what we've seen here, women are seen as more helpful than men. Helpful only carries you so far. Men are seen as at least non-significantly more agentic than women, but, ag but agentic language pays off more for men than women. Women get more vague feedback and it's more damning for them. Okay, so this is a gloomy story, but yet, okay, yet some people are making it to the top. So every time I would talk, show those other slides, people were like, how do women get to the top then? You've just laid out you know, no path forward. So I wanna just drill down on that last question and ask if there are gender profiles or pathways for what the company calls top talent. Okay, I want to specifically now focus on the people who are getting a five rating and compare them to everybody else, okay? Ha getting a five, everybody in this company knows, is what you're after, okay? So let's look at the men and women who are fives. And what we see is if you compare men who have fives to women have, who have fives, men have more codes relating to their leadership ability, their managerial skills, and they have more of that agentic language, okay? So that's what differentiates men in the five bucket from women, what about the other? What about women? What do they have more of? One thing, more comments about their personality. Now, it's positive personality comments. They're getting a five, okay? But notice, we've got women at the top with these you know, bubbly, positive, cheery personalities, and we've got men at the top that are described as having leadership ability, managerial skills, and, and you know, this more of this agentic language, okay? One last slide of data. This is very messy, so I'll just unpack it. 
We now wanted to look at this one final way to you know, push the data as far as I possibly could or perhaps even farther than I should, but I want to show this to you. Um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to um, model the effect of getting a five rating relative to all the other ratings as a function of the counts of different language codes. And we did this for all 93 of our codes. These are linear probability models for those of you who uh, want, to, uh, want to know that. Um, and we have the coefficients for women on this axis, coefficients for men on that one. And that 45 degree line you see going up through the slide, um, all the codes there are working similarly for men and women. Okay, and there's a lot of codes there. So there's a, you know, there is a lot of meritocratic stuff going on here. And then there's the outliers, and I'm gonna just uh, blow up four of them for you to be able to see. Uh, this one is a code called Ideal Worker. The Ideal Worker uh, is, a, is a, the person who is always there for work, willing to work late nights and weekends. It's what we expect of workers in our modern workplace to sort of put your job first above everything else. And so what we see is that for both men and women, the more I, the, for every additional Ideal Worker code they have, the likelihood of them getting a five goes up, okay? But it does so more for men than for women. 23.5% uh, for men and 15.3% for women, okay? So that's, the, that's ideal worker. And it works sort of similarly, but more strongly for men. Shout out, okay? A shout out, uh, an example, a shout out is when in your own review, um, you're somebody, you're, somebody else is being talked about. So, you know, somebody's writing about me, for example, and said, Shelly wrote a really great paper, but Kim helped her with it, okay? That'd be a shout out to Kim. And, and, and you know, that's good for Kim, but it would not be good for Shelly, okay? Uh, and what we see is that a shout out to somebody else on your review is negative for both men and women, but it's more negative for women than men. The final two I want us to think about in, in, in conversation with each other. This is a code asked for promotion. This is a code that appears if the person asked for a promotion, okay? So does asking for a promotion help you end up in a top talent bucket? It, it does if you're a man. 33% increases the likelihood of getting a five by 33% and goes down by negative 15.6% for women, okay? So asking for a promotion is good for men, bad for women. What about if you have a sponsor, okay? A sponsor is someone who's advocating for you. So it might be, if, if Kim is a sponsor, she might be telling, she might be the one out saying, you really should promote Shelly, okay? And what we see here is that having a sponsor advocate for you increases the odds of a woman getting a five, but decreases it for men. So if we put this together, when women let somebody else ask for them, but don't ask for themselves, they're rewarded, and men are rewarded when they ask for themselves, but don't have somebody else doing it for them. Okay, so in conc to conclude this part, um, you know, I ask, is this a, are, these, are, these formal are these formal procedures a, a, a smokescreen or a level? Where, well, they're kind of something of a smoky leveler. I mean, we, just, well, we punt on this question. They seem to be doing a lot. There's a lot of places where we don't find um, gender differences and, and these relationships, and that should be talked about. And there are, but yet, there are places that are somewhat worrisome. So uh, practical implications, and then I'm going to tell you what we've done to try to solve this problem. Practical implications is that first, anyone who evaluates the performance of others needs to be aware of the potential of stereotypes to affect their judgments. And I point that out here because there are a lot of people in the room here, me myself included, that do a lot of evaluating of other people, right? I mean, it's what we do. for faculty, we do this. If you think about how much of your time you're spent evaluating other people, their papers, your students. Um, so not surprisingly, um, we find similar kinds of effects in academic life as well, okay? So three recent studies that have analyzed the language of letters of recommendation that were written for applicants for faculty positions. Psychology, biochemistry, medical school, across the three studies. Psychology, we see that there's more agentic language on men's reviews and more um, communal language on women's, just like we saw in my study. Um, chemistry, biochemistry, more standout adjectives were found on the, the, uh, on the letters for men faculty applicants. And more doubt-raising rhetoric, okay, on the letters for women. Recent study came out about a month ago that shows that doubt raising, okay, I, don't, I wonder if she got those grants and publications on her own or anything along those lines, even one doubt raising phrase on a letter greatly lowers how the research competence of the person, the perceived research competence of the person that the letter is being written about. So faculty, students in the room, not off the hook either, 
Uh, so students evaluate faculty, okay? And so what, what you can do here with this tool is you can put in a descriptor of faculty, and then it will pull on the Rate My Professor data set, uh, a database which you probably know of, and it will do a gender analysis for you. So I want to just show you, I put genius in, so put this standout word in here, and what we get here, blue dots are men on the right, women in orange on the left. Across a bunch of disciplines, what we see is that men faculty are more likely to be described by students as genius than are um, women, than are women faculty. And it's also fun because you can play with it by discipline as well. It goes on further, but I, I just took a screenshot and I had to, I wanted to get my own discipline in here. So I cut it off at sociology. So sociology is our, sociologists are seen as less genius than music and physics uh, faculty. But, but nonetheless, across all of them, you see this difference. OK, just two more examples of this. Um, helpful, we see this communal language. I put in helpful. Yes, we see it again, OK? Uh, women, are, women are seen as more helpful um, than men are, OK? Consistent with the stuff we show, we find in our, um, in our study. And sociology didn't even make it on the list this time, so um, oh well. <laughs> I, should, I really, it wouldn't fit if I kept going. Um, so, and then finally, I wanted to put this likability penalty in there, this idea that when women are competent, they're seen as less likable. So I put in mean and annoying, and here we see that women across the board are seen as more mean and annoying. So this is taking us a little off topic, but I just think it's important when talking about this to sort of think about the way we're making our own evaluations. And then I think the, more, the other important practical set of practical implications is these differences come about under conditions of ambiguity and uncertainty. So it would be helpful to make the criteria under which we evaluate people more clear, um, to not use criteria that have gender biases built into them, okay? Fire departments around the US used to have height as a requirement, okay? Height as a requirement is nice because you can objectively apply it to everyone, but it filters out more women than men and men from some ethnic groups. And guess what? It has nothing to do with firefighting. So an objective, irrelevant criteria, it's no longer legal to do so. Um, so in our own case, thinking about a criteria that might have gender biases built into them, and then we should ensure that the criteria are applied consistently to all employees. So this is what I'm gonna kind of move to now as we start, as I wrap up by talking about what we're doing with these kinds of companies to get beyond the, these effects that I've just shown you. So the data I just shared with you, I shared with large tech. Um, you know, we're looking at them, you know, and saying, wow, they were looking at them, um, I mean, gloom set over the room, okay? These are people who thought they were doing really good work and could not think of any reason why um, the patterns that we found should have come about. Um, so this was motivating to them in terms of um, wanting to work to get beyond these effects. So here's the approach to change that I want to talk to you a little bit about. And this is something we've been doing with companies um, all over the Silicon Valley and beyond. Um, and so uh, basically, uh, the way we've thought about getting rid of bias up to this point in time is first to educate managers, okay? The idea behind unconscious bias training, which I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, is that if you train people about the way that stereotypes lead to bias, managers will be more careful in their decision making. But yet the research has shown that even when we do that, bias still enters into the performance evaluation process. So the next step that people usually take is to try to limit the discretion on this manager. Okay, as illustrated, this is one of my favorite quotes. It's kind of, it's kind of a mean and overstated quote, but it, it makes the point. People make mistakes and hence should be designed out of the system whenever possible. Okay, it's so like, get rid of this fact of this manager. You know, this is the problem. What we're doing instead is we're working with managers. Okay, we're going into these organizations, uh, training managers about bias, but we're working with them to create tools that can help reduce these effects, okay? And so that's what I wanna end up with today is on a positive note. Okay, so uh, I recently wrote a paper about uh, Kim Melita to a small win, uh, this kind of a small wins approach to, to change. And basically, a small win, okay, is what we're gonna be going for here. A small win is a gain that has, it's a, has a modest size, okay, so not huge, we're not boiling the ocean, but of, of a modest size and that's visible to people, okay? How are we gonna get a small win in terms of re re reducing these biases? We start off by educating managers, we then go in and diagnose bias, like I just showed you with something like that performance review analysis. Then we work with managers to develop tools, okay? Then we're going to roll that tool out and evaluate its success at producing a small win, okay? The thing I like about small wins is they seem doable to people, okay? If you say we're gonna solve all of gender, equal all of gender inequality tomorrow, people are gonna go back to bed, okay? It's just, that's too overwhelming. Break it down into something we can do small. The beauty of small wins is that a manager designs a tool and we assess it and it's 
it's effective, this can lead to a ca contagion, okay? Um, a sense of increasing their sense of efficacy that they can do better things in their environment. So let me illustrate. Okay, so with large tech, what we did, with it, we had a team of managers, and we worked with them, and they, what we decided to do is they were going to create a checklist that they could use during the performance review process. Okay, so there are five teams of managers, 16 in all, and so the first step and the hard step is we worked with managers to more clearly spell out the criteria they were using to assess their employees and to develop measures of it that they could, in fact, measure, okay? Um, and so what they decided to do, these were five different functional teams, they had a two-part checklist. Did you collect the following evidence or data for the past six months? Okay, and they listed the criteria under that. Each team populated this with their own stuff. So you might imagine if we were doing this in sociology and economics and political science, um, we, know, we might have different criteria we would put under this. And then part B, while writing the evaluation, did you discuss and con consider and discuss? This is to make sure they're using the criteria, okay? So this is an example from the communications team. Um, did you discuss the employee's strengths and weaknesses and communicating deadline on budget, okay? Down at the bottom, did you discuss other criteria not included? If so, make note of it. So if a new criteria comes up, oh, I need to see her teaching ability, write that down, go back and apply it to everyone. So this is a very, this, uh, a little time consuming to produce, but very simple to use. And um, so what we predicted is that, man what we would predict is if managers use this tool, they're gonna have more confidence in the process. Remember, almost no one thought the process was very good. Um, the, that post-intervention, the written performance, uh, performance evaluations would contain fewer of the gender differences that we saw and that the relationship between language and ratings wouldn't differ for men and women. Right now, we're coding the, the post-intervention reviews. What I have to show you is just the first uh, about their confidence and then I'm going to show you some results for, from one other case to end my talk. So, um, increased confidence. These managers, we bring all these managers to the room, we spend a whole day with them working on this exercise of coming up with clearer criteria. Some of the managers were ex very excited to be working on this. Some of them were kind of like, oh, whatever. And others thought this was an ultimate, utter waste of time. You know, calculating the dollar value of people in the room. You know, why are we doing this? And this will be reflected in their comments, okay? My most enthusiastic manager. This was awesome, okay? This, everything was awesome to this guy. Um, I always wanted to be a nice person before I was lost. I didn't have criteria, now I do. I'm judging everyone the same. So this person's really on board, okay? This person, um, you know, enthusiastic, but you sort of see the sort of, it was, I was surprised. This actually helped us, this helped us be consistent across board. So you're using a, a thing that tells you how to evaluate people and you're more consistent and that's a surprise, but okay, on board. My most reluctant manager, if you give them the checklist ahead of time, they'll know what they're being evaluated on. It makes a manager's life easier in the end. So at least conceding that this day's work meant that the employees knew how they would be evaluated and now his job was easier. And then evidence of a bit of this uh, contagion. Um, we're, this person, we're hiring right now and I found myself talking about the position and the team and what our expectations and the teams were from the checklist. So in other words, took what he learned from putting the checklist together for evaluating people's performance and turned it into something he could use when making hiring decisions. So notice, manager train creates a tool, develops some efficacy in his ability to make change and carries on um, the next step himself. Okay. I want to show you one more of our, uh, uh, quickly summarize one more intervention for a, a different technology company I'll call mid-sized tech. Okay, so this one's smaller, as by the name suggests. Um, and so we started off by diagnosing bias again in this organization. And I want to say going in and doing an analysis with people in their own company and collecting data is very important. Because when you go in and just talk about the social science literature on bias, show people those resume studies like I show you, those are logically very convincing and they're not motivating. You know, that was psychology. We're in sociology, as people would say to me, as if that's a huge big difference, you know. And, you know, or you may have found this in this company, but we're data driven. You wouldn't find it here. Data in people's own company is helpful, or their own university. Um, so what we did, we interviewed leaders first about how they were assessing, uh, how they were assessing uh, people they were evaluating. Um, and uh, they had no consistent process in place. In fact, they would tell me things like, you know, we're, I'm using the Yahoo process. This wasn't Yahoo, so somebody worked at Yahoo and had a process, and now was using it here in this company. Many of their values were, so, were very vague. So be phenomenal. You were supposed to evaluate people based on be phenomenal. It's not even hard, it's hard to know what you would do. And some measures of success had gender biases built into them. So they wanted their leaders to be responsive, okay, to, to, to the people that were reporting to them, and that's a good thing. But they were implicitly measuring responsiveness by how quickly people were sending email back when they sent an email to them. 
And they found out at further study that women were sending email back more slowly during the dinner hour. Huh, wonder why that might be. And so we pressed them a little on this and they went back and instead looked at the usefulness of the email responses they got. Turns out a quick email response can be the least helpful thing in the world, right? So I said, good job. You know, it's not helpful. Okay, so then we went and observed their calibration meeting. So this is our main source of data here. So now this is one step further in the chain. And what we found here again is that women were receiving more criticisms of their personality, more time was spent discussing men, and men were getting more standout adjectives, and women were more likely to have their ratings downgraded. Too many people in the top box, this is gonna cost us money, the women get shoved back down, okay, who had originally been rated higher. So, what do we do with them? We, working with them, we created a scorecard that they were to complete for each employee uh, before they came into the calibration meeting. They updated their values and measures, okay, and they took the open-ended questions that had been part of this process, and managers were now asked to provide specific feedback. If there's one piece of advice I can kind of blanketly give anytime I go into a place is ban the open box. I mean, this is just opening the door for people to write whatever. Um, they also decided they were going to use criteria monitors during the meetings to make sure the same criteria were being applied to uh, men and women, and the highest leaders um, took this role. And then they allocated a specific, specific amount of time for discussing each employee. So what we found, okay, what are the small wins here? First, I went to the calibration meetings following the creation of this scorecard, and every manager that came to the meeting had completed a scorecard for every single employee. And these were actually, these scorecards were uh, quite amazing. They kept iterating and iterating on them after we were done with them. Um, they completed a scorecard. So probably not surprisingly, since they had this sitting in front of them when they were talking about employees, there was greater consistency in them using the criteria um, when discussing the various employees. The gender differences and the criticism of personality were eliminated, okay, we did not find any more gender differences, and the gender gaps and down, downgrading women's ratings, um, that, those gender gaps were no longer significant. And finally, this produced other change efforts. After the success of this intervention, they went back and completely overhauled how they were doing their hiring process and noticing things that had for somehow or another been oblivious them to them before. For example, having job ads, this is a tech company that says that we're looking to hire a ninja coder who can wrestle problems to the ground and asking themselves if perhaps that ad was not equally welcoming to all sectors of society. <laughs> now, I mentioned to you at the very beginning of the talk that when you do studies like this, you're under a non-disclosure agreement. You can't say the name of the company that you were working with, okay? So I'm at a conference and this company that we worked with, the CEO standing on stage and says, we worked with Shelley Carell at the Clayman Institute on this. And I'm like, you're not supposed to be saying that. So um, he liked the result and so you know, he wanted to be talking about it. So they voluntarily re re released the non-disclosure agreement and now we can say who they are. The company is GoDaddy, okay? And so the New York Times wrote this article, if GoDaddy can turn the corner on sexism, who can't? W what do they mean by this? Well, GoDaddy, it turns out, um, what the number one thing people know about GoDaddy is not the product they made. It's that they had the most sexist Super Bowl ads in the history of the Super Bowl, okay? That's a, that's a high bar to get over the most sexist. <laughs> you know, and, and the new CEO comes in and thinks that perhaps this might be undermining their gender diversity uh, initiative. So uh, they call us, and I'm at first like, no way, we're not touching this. But he was very sincere. We go in and we do this work with them. They've done a lot of other work themselves, so I'm not going to take full credit for this New York Times article. But what we see here is they were able to make a lot of improvements to the point that GoDaddy has now been rated as one of the top places for women in technology. So um, the, I think the moral of the story is um, that sm small wins can add up to bigger things, and the kind of things that we know as social scientists can be used to advance social change. So I'll stop there and just leave you with one of my favorite cartoons. Uh -huh.